Hello, this is Michael Hoke, and we're going to talk about seizure search patterns on MRI. As long as you have a pattern and stick to it, you'll be better for it. And today we're going to go over what my pattern is. So, disclaimer, up front, this is not a laundry list lecture of lesions that cause seizure. The goal of this lecture is for you to get better at finding these subtle lesions. Now, why is this difficult? Well, seizure search pattern for MRI is not routinely taught at the workstation. Uh, like I said before, these lesions can be subtle, and also we have time constraints. In busy academic practices or even in private practices, you can't spend a half hour with each case, although we'd like to. You probably only have like 8-10 minutes. So we'll go over my search pattern, uh, hit the highlights, we'll hit some uh, pearls and pitfalls. A lot of my pearls are gray pearls. They're not in the literature, but anecdotally I've found that they have been helpful and keep me out of trouble. And then a summary slide at the end. So my pattern, to make it catchy so you can remember it, is 3, 2, 1, go to the hippocampus. So the 3, as we're counting down, the 3 is the T1 MP rage because there's three imaging planes, sagittal, coronal, and axial. On um, each one of those planes, you're going to look for something a little bit different. The 2 is for the flare uh, because there's two imaging planes, and we're going to window the flare at two different window level settings. One is for the gradient echo or the SWI depending on what you do at your at your practice just in the axial plane and that's pretty much just for the cavernous malformations. And then last but not least we'll go to the hippocampus just like when you read a chest x-ray you look at the bones, the mediastinum, the upper abdomen and you look at the lungs last in seizure surge pattern look at the hippocampus last. Alright we'll start with the T1 MP rage again three planes Sagittal, axial, coronal, three poles. So starting with the sagittal midline, you always want to just clear that sagittal midline and this is a normal picture. Here's somebody that's grossly abnormal with a hypothalamic hamartoma. And here's somebody with a more subtle lesion of a hypothalamic adhesion. The hypothalamic adhesions can resemble a small hamartoma, but they're, these are more almond shaped and they're kind of an attachment between both sides of the hypothalamus. Some people think that it's a form fruit of prosencephaly. Other people think they're incidental. I have found in my limited experience that when I see one, I want to look elsewhere in the brain for additional findings. So once after, after we clear the midline on the sagittal, we're going to go to the perisylvian on both sides of the brain, left and right. And here's a normal image for comparison. Here's a case of an extensive polymicrogyria. And here's the case of a subtle cortical dysplasia. I found that any time or any location where the brain folds on itself, like the inner hemispheric fissure or the sylvian fissures, tend to be good areas to find seizure foci. T1 MP rage pitfall. So this is our first pitfall. Contrast is bad. Do not waste your time acquiring T1 MP rage post contrast and do not waste your time looking at it because you will never find subtle lesions. The contrast is different and not optimized for finding cortical lesions and the contrast in the peel blood vessels often masks subtle lesions. So can you see the lesion here? Of course not. But if you had a regular non-contrast MP rage you can easily see the subtle microgyria. So just say no to gadolinium. Just get a regular spin echo 2D T1 post contrast if you're going to do that in your protocol. All right, now moving on to the coronal, we want to look at the three poles of the brain, the frontal pole, the temporal pole, and the occipital pole. So here's a case of an occipital pole dysplasia. These poles tend to have dysplasias. And then here's a subtle frontal pole dysplasia on the right. For completeness, here's a temporal pole dysplasia. You can see blurring of the gray-white matter margin. In addition to looking for dysplasias at the poles, another pearl is if you have somebody with what looks to be a flattened, expanded, empty cella, you want to look for the correlation of IIH, intracranial hypertension, and increased pressures causing temporal, temporal pole encephaloceles that can be a source of seizures. You can also look, another common area where these encephaloceles happen with IIH is in the anterior cranial fossa in the orbital frontal region where I've seen encephaloceles break through and plop down into the uh, orbit. So you want to look at your poles, frontal and temporal pole, if you see somebody with seizures and what looks like IIH. Moving on to, with the coronal, after we look at the poles, we're going to look at the ventricles, and you want to look for your heterotopias. They're going to be T1 isointense, the cortex lining the ventricles. I found that they're often missed back in the occipital horns and the temporal horns. Here's a good case of some. Here comes our second pitfall. So the caudate tail, 
what's circled is a heterotopia. So that's what a typical heterotopia looks like. But what you don't want to overcall are these normal structures lining the temporal horn, which are the caudate tails. So they're bilateral symmetric. They're in every person. Normal structure, caudate tail. Don't overcall it. Again, this is a heterotopia. These are caudate tails. All right, and then last, on the axial MP rage, I'm going to look at the brain, kind of like take a step back, a six-foot view, and just look at global and regional asymmetry. Here's a case of band heterotopia. Here's a case of right occipital hemimegencephaly with accelerated myelination. Um, and here's a case of schizencephaly. You know, you want to look for right versus left comparison, and then anterior versus posterior comparison. And also, you want to look for second lesions and even third lesions in this patient with schizencephaly and missing septum septo-optic dysplasia. Okay? Let's move on to the flare. Again, emphasizing we're going to look at axial and coronal and two window setting levels. So when the tech sends over the flare, sometimes it's an inappropriate windowing level, as you see here on the far left. And then you want to take your, your mouse on your PAC system and window it so it's correct where the signal in the air outside the brain is black and dark and then you want to look at it on axial and coronal on that window level setting and then you want to window it aggressively where you window out all the white matter and just the cortex is showing. That's kind of like a double inversion recovery look to it but you don't have to waste time acquiring a double inversion recovery. So you want to window it to correctly, look at it on axial and coronal, and then window it aggressively and looks at it, look at it again on axial and coronal, and these cortical lesions should pop out. Here's some examples. Here's a cortical dysplasia. Can't miss it. Here's another one. You might miss it on the correct uh, window, but when you window it aggressively, it stands right out. Definitely helpful. Another pearl is what the EEG can't see. This is an area you should really look and scrutinize on the flare. So where the EEG can't see because it's a surface electrodes is the deep parts of the brain. So the interhemispheric fissure involving the cingulate cortex, the insular cortex covered by the operculum, and then the basal temporal lobes. So here are two cases, two different patients. Both patients had non-localizing EEG, and this person had a cingulate dysplasia, and this other person had an insular dysplasia. Again, look where the EEG can't. All right, and then last, the GRE just one axial plane, and we're pretty much just looking for cavernous malformations. Frontal and occipital poles on this patient on the left, and this patient on the right had multiple as well, with some siderosis from bleeding and lesions in their basal temporal lobes. All right, and finally, uh, hippocampus. Always look here last. Save the best for last. The common thing that everybody always wants to look for is mesial temporal sclerosis, but that requires three findings. Volume loss, T2 slash flare hyperintensity, and architectural distortion. You need these three findings if you're going to call mesial temporal sclerosis. And remember, a certain percentage, up to 10% of cases, have bilateral pathology, so you want to look at both. A nice trick is to look for secondary signs. So the output of the hippocampus through the fornix to the mammillary body, you could look there for signs of atrophy in this person with right mesial temporal sclerosis, the right mammillary body and the right fornix are atrophy. Uh, another pitfall, so we're looking at the flare and you might say, well, that left hippocampus is brighter than the right. So then maybe that's mesial temporal lobe sclerosis. But if you take a step back and look that the uh, temporal lobe and the cerebellum are both brighter than the contralateral, temporal lobe and cerebellum, then you realize this is an overcall from RF inhomogeneity artifact at 3 Tesla. So if the entire lower left side of the brain is br brighter than the right, that's probably an overcall. And you can go to the T2 and look and see that there's no signal abnormality or architectural distortion in the left hippocampus. So this is another trick when you're windowing the flare that you can come across this RF overcall. Mesial temporal lobe enlargement. So if something's enlarged, it's not mesial temporal lobe sclerosis. Like in this case, this is a tumor, a bubbly D-net. Here's another one. This patient initially presented with an enlarged left amygdala. Um, they were untreated for what this turned out to be was autoimmune encephalitis, enlarged amygdala with autoimmune encephalitis. And several months later, they eventually had hippocampal sclerosis. Um, secondary hippocampal sclerosis. So this is hippocampal sclerosis, not from temporal lobe epilepsy. These commonly have dual pathologies and they're more prevalent in kids with worse outcomes. So if you see hippocampal sclerosis and the adjacent mesial temporal lobe structures appear normal, do another check on that same hemisphere for the initial lesion. 
in this case it was another DNet, um, but do another check in that same hemisphere for the primary lesion causing seizures and then secondary hippocampal sclerosis. It's burning the hippocampus out with its constant seizures. Okay, so I've seen that a few times where there's a primary lesion elsewhere in the hemisphere and then there's secondary hippocampal sclerosis because you would hate to have them resect the mesial temporal lobe and the hippocampus and the patient still have seizures from their missed primary lesion. All right, and then nice little summary slide here that Tim Shepard lent me differentiating temporal lobe from frontal lobe seizures. So you can look at the auras. The temporal lobe seizures will have kind of limbic system auras, burning smell, deja vu, epigastric rising, and the frontal lobe seizures usually happen at nighttime and they're more motor in, uh, makes sense, right? More motor in their features. Temporal lobe seizures tend to be slow and last long where frontal lobe seizures are rapid and brief. And then common features of temporal lobe seizures is usually emotionless state or postictal confusion where the frontal lobe seizures are complex postures, hypermotor and bipedal or leg motions. So just rehashing this, my surge pattern, MP rage first in three planes, sagittal midline, sagittal perisylvian, coronal looking at the ventricles, coronal looking at the three poles, frontal, temporal, occipital poles, and then the axial looking at like our six foot view or global view. Moving to the flare, you're going to look at the two window settings, correct and aggressive, and you're going to look at axial and coronals. Don't forget to look where the EEG can't see, cingulate gyrus, insular gyrus, and then 3, 2, 1, go to the hippocampus last. Thanks.